Transboundary water is pivotal for sustainable development and global water security, serving 2.8 billion people, covering 42% of the Earth's surface and flowing through 153 countries. Enhancing water cooperation over transboundary water will be crucial for a water secure world. Managers and practitioners of transboundary water are important catalyzers to boost this cooperation. They have requested for learning opportunities on how to improve governance aspects of transboundary freshwater security. The course will cover water security, international water law, water diplomacy, institutions, management tools, and financing. The course is dynamic, engaging the world-renowned professionals and international organizations, and showcasing many case studies around the world. The course is open for anyone who is interested in the subject to join. We look forward to welcoming you to the course. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. It is a great pleasure to warmly welcome you to this 14th session of the Transboundary Freshwater Security Governance Train. My name is Yumiko Yasuda. I'm the Senior Transboundary Water Cooperation Specialist at the Global Water Partnership and the lead faculty of the massive open online course on governance for transboundary freshwater security, which was developed by GWP and GEF IW Learn, along with many global partners and experts from the field of transboundary water. Since opening of this course in August 2020, the MOOC has attracted over 3,300 participants from 163 countries around the world, confirming the need and interest of learning about this subject. The course is available for anyone to take at their own pace, and also it is now translated into French, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, and Russian. And we, in order to enhance the learning experience and to provide opportunities for people to engage and interact with experts in the field, GWP together with partners have developed this online interactive session series called Transboundary Freshwater Security Governance Train. I think many of you have already been participating to this. And in this series of events, we are highlighting not only the key topics of transboundary freshwater governance, but also to highlight the various examples and expertise from different geographic locations around the globe, as if the train is stopping at the various locations in the world. Today, our train will be stopping at North America and Europe, welcoming speakers from these places. Now the MOOC is celebrating its third year of implementation. We started the season three of this event series last um, in September. We have three events within this um, autumn. And today is actually the last session of this, this year, actually. And it is co-hosted by GWP and the Oregon State University, who has been the partner to this MOOC. Today's session has two main parts. The first part is the panel discussion by distinguished speakers, where they will be sharing their experiences on the topic and answering your question. The second part is the breakout session where you will be engaging directly with experts. We have a great lineup of session chairs and speakers for the next one and a half hours. And after the event, please also stay tuned in because you will have an opportunity to continue this conversation through Transboundary Water Knowledge Exchange Hub and its post-event discussion thread. We have some housekeeping rules. This online session will, is recorded, so people who couldn't join due to other commitments or time zone will be able to also view the discussion. Please always mute your audio when the moderator or speakers are presenting. You have an opportunity to speak, uh, mute and speak during the breakout session. The event will not only present the new knowledge, but will also welcome your input in the interactive part. And this interactive part is something that is quite unique about this event series. 
as opposed to a regular webinar. So we really appreciate your participation throughout the session till the end. As I said, the today's session is designed to be interactive as possible for you to be able to ask your questions to experts and also provide your thoughts and feedback to the subject. We are using the Mentimeter as a main interactive tool, particularly during this first session. Some of you have already used this Mentimeter while waiting for the event to start. So let's see the first Mentimeter questions uh, from all of you. So this question, where you're joining from, if you haven't uh, yet logged into Mentimeter, please go to www.menti.com and then uh, type in the code 88121221. And please, in this map, pin in where you are coming from. And we really have a, a, a wide range of people participates from participating from all around the world. <clears throat> I can see. From the Far East, I see someone from Japan is joining. Very nice, it's my country. Welcome. We also see people from, from the Indonesia area, um, South Asia, also Central, um, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Asia. Also, we see a lot of participants from Africa and North America. Very, very welcome. And thank you also for <clears throat> colleagues who have typed in where you're coming from in the chat. Thank you very much. So let's go to the next. So today's topic is about the use of data in a water, transboundary water management and negotiation. We'd love to hear what you think is the most important type of data for water negotiations. Here are different, different uh, options here. Inform, uh, data about the physical situation of the water or the chemical, the water quality issues, the social issues, or the economic data, or the legal data. It's a tough choice, but yes, I can see a lot of people are typing the social data is important. That's very interesting to see. Um, we typically think that data, we, people would want some physical data, but yes, physical data is also catching up in this poll. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for these inputs. So let's go to the next question. Which of the following data sets are you familiar with? So there are a number of data sets that we will be introducing today. Uh, there is this Global Water Partnership Toolbox, International Waters Learning Exchange and Resource Network, that is IWLEARN, Transboundary Water Assessment Program, which is called TWAP for short, Transboundary Freshwater Diplomacy Database housed by Oregon State University, and water law governance and diplomacy platform. Let us know which data set that you are familiar with. Well, really nice to see that we have a high number of our GWP toolbox data sets been already been quite familiar with, followed by the Oregon State University's database that as now I think Aaron will tell us that it's just changed the name recently from the dispute to the diplomacy. Very interesting. And uh, yes, I also see that TWAP getting um, some uh, interest here. I mean, it's not a popular vote. It's just people what people already know about it. In today's event, we will be specifically introducing three of these data sets. So I think after this event, I think you will be able to, to Pin, tick all of the boxes actually, or most of this in this choice. Thank you so much. Very helpful to know already who knows what in these available data sets. Now, um, I would like to then open the last final question. It's the most important one for today's interactive part. Please type or vote any questions you would like to ask the panelists. 
So what is going to happen is now you will be hearing the intervention by our chairs and panelists. And then as you listen, you can go and type in any questions you may have. Or if you see other people's question and you also agree with that question, you can vote up that question. Then during the panel discussion, the moderator will be picking some of the popular questions that are prioritized by the participants. So this is the first interactive part of today's event. Thank you very much. So now let us go in, dive into the meat of the um, today's uh, today's event. We have uh, two event chairs. We are very happy to have Lineta De Silva, who is a co-director and instructor in the water conflict transformation at Oregon State University, and uh, Aaron Wolf, professor of geography in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. You can go next, please. So Lynette is a co-director of this program at the Oregon State University on the Water Conflict Management Transformation, a very famous program. And I also had a pleasure to take some part in it. It was very, very interesting. For the past 20 years, she has also worked in areas emphasizing water resources, land management, and practices. She's also co-authored a book titled Resolving Environmental Conflict Principles and Concepts. The, the, here in our event, we are very much fond of this fun fact of our speakers. So Lynette's fun fact is that the last meal on the earth would be a madras curry with roti. Very interesting. I would love to taste this to know why Lynette would like to eat this curry as the last thing that she would eat. Um, her biggest achievement is continuing to be joyful. Very, very important. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. And I, we are very also happy to have Professor Aaron Wolf, who I think many of you know about, and he is also uh, featured in our MOOC. He's speaking, uh, he's giving two lectures in our MOOC, uh, if anyone has seen the module two on the water diplomacy negotiation. So Aaron is a professor at Oregon State University also, as well as IHC Delft. Um, also since 2020, a member of the board of International Center for Water Cooperation, ICWC. He's been training a lot of uh, um, uh, water practitioners, diplomats on the conflict mediators and also facilitation skills and so on. He's also acted as, as a consultant to US government agencies on several international governments and organizations on various aspects of transparent water resources and dispute resolution. So a lot of his teaching is coming also from all of these experiences. He's also uh, authored over um, around 100 journal articles, which is super impressive. So here is a quote from Aaron, the war over water seems neither strategically rational, hydrologically effective, nor economically viable. Very true. And Aaron's fun fact was that he was once an ordinary seaman in the US merchant marines for a year, visiting port cities around the world and traveling the Panama Canal. It sounds like he has seen all the waters on the earth through this experience. So very welcome, Lynette and Aaron. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Yumiko. And, and it's always a pleasure to be partnering with, uh, with you and your uh, amazing team uh, at GWP. And it's, so, it's such a pleasure to see so many uh, familiar faces from all over the world. And of course, uh, always a, a joy when uh, Professor Wong uh, pops in uh, from uh, wherever he happens to be. So um, yeah, so, so just to, to start us off thinking about this issue of data, I, I always start with this same slide uh, thinking about kind of two views of watersheds. And the ones on the left are the things that you measure. When we're getting data, it's about the physical watershed. It's the flow, it's the uh, quality, it's quantity, it's timing. 
Uh, and what's emphasized are the things that are connected. But on the right, we always have to remember that people are involved. And, and sometimes the things that people do are measurable, the borders, uh, the, the uh, boundaries. Um, and oftentimes what they do and what they care about is not measurable. And I, I think in our, in our work in water diplomacy, our perpetual job is to try and balance these two views. The next slide, please. As we move into thinking about data and its place in negotiations and, and diplomacy, uh, we need to remi remind ourselves of a couple of limitations. One is uncertainty. This is true in both social data and physical data. My own start professionally was in groundwater where we're perpetually reminded uh, that there can be three or four or even five orders of magnitude of uncertainty when we're trying to figure out flow simply by drilling holes in the ground and trying to interpolate what's happening between where we can observe. And so oftentimes the things that we can measure, uh, we're, we're, we're less uh, willing to report or emphasize these error bars, but we need to know that they're there if we're going to be using data to help us make decisions. Next slide, please. Oftentimes in negotiations, data has been extremely useful and, and a, a requirement uh, for moving forward on, um, on negotiations. Sometimes, unfortunately, the lack of data has been used to postpone negotiations or to keep a status quo. Uh, in places where it's been useful, this is the Jordan uh, River watershed. Um, and I, uh, back in the 1950s, there were negotiations between uh, Israel and its Arab neighbors around how to share those waters. Uh, and the, the negotiations were deadlocked until there was a study done by a, a U.S. company uh, called Maine uh, that, that assessed how much water to, would be used or could be used for gravity-fed irrigation within the basin. And once they did that, it became clear how an allocation mechanism might be used. And that in and of itself, that piece of information in and of itself was enough to overcome uh, this deadlock and to move negotiations forward. So occasionally we do find that being able to measure things and reporting on things uh, has been useful. In early Nile uh, negotiations, uh, there was one country that was insisting that water is secret, water data is secret and the security issue. And then one of the mediators had all of the publicly available data just brought in and kind of dumped it on the table and, and pointed out that what you think is secret is all, often not secret, and it should not be a barrier to negotiations. Next slide, please. I always show this slide as well, just to remind us when we're talking about water, uh, one way to think about it is the, the four types of water. We have on the left side, physical water that we move, that we touch. We have mental water that we calculate, that we think about efficiencies. And this left side are the things that we can measure and end up in our databases. But often the roots of uh, conflict are going to be this thing on the right side, uh, water tied emotionally to history, to sovereignty, to power, or spiritual water, water tied to all of our faith traditions. Next slide, please. Finally, I just want to ask, so often the science people and the, and the physical people uh, insist or are looking for enough data for a good model. And when you ask them how much data is necessary, the answer always is more. But maybe we can flip the question and ask uh, the opposite question, N not how do you get more data, but rather what is the least amount of data uh, uh, necessary for a reasonably good decision. So as we think about these things, the places where data can be useful in negotiations, uh, but not to allow it to be used as an excuse not to enter in or to uh, come to uh, negotiations. On that, I'd, I'd like to turn over to, uh, to my co-chair uh, as we move forward thinking about data and diplomacy. Thank you. Lynette?
Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm delighted to be here. So what is missing from the data set is what is missing in society in general, which is equal representation for nature, for indigenous and marginalized communities, and for women. For example, a 2018 study conducted by De Silva, Villiers and Neal stated that there's a gap in the literature concerning women's roles as decision makers when it comes to water resources and higher levels of decision making. This is a problem because if there are data gaps, the data used for negotiations and management of transboundary waters is therefore not representative of the entire population. So without equal representation and data representation, decisions surrounding fresh water do not benefit all groups, putting at risk the physical, emotional and mental well-being of communities and ecosystems. This creates resource-based disputes, conflicts, and inequity. Slide, next slide, please. For example, part of the challenge that results in not having data about the role of women in transboundary water governance, making decisions at the regional, national, and international scales, is that there cannot be growth in our understanding of how women currently contribute to transboundary freshwater security governance. The longer we leave such gaps unaddressed, women's potential is not realized. This leaves sectors in society in poverty with marginalized access to fresh water and freshwater infrastructure, unable to contribute to communities' needs, social mobility, market gains, and social environmental sustainability. Also, as you can see in the slide, the social, economic, ecosystem, and governance involvement are interconnected. With major gaps, this means that we cannot adequately address freshwater security. Next slide, please. Part of the solution then is that we should be filling the environmental water data gaps with information regarding intersectionality that includes, for example, gender and race and class that is at and across local, national and international scale. Another type of data related to women that was recently captured was that 31 major peace processes between 1992 and 2011 revealed that only 9% of negotiators were women, but that when women are part of the negotiating process, peace lasts longer. The benefit then of incorporating all of these types of data is ultimately to bring about social environmental sustainability through the development and implementation of policy so that women, marginalized communities and nature get to share more equitably in opportunities and scarce resources. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron and Lynette, for really setting the scene by really showing really how this data issue is connected to the overall uh, transboundary water management and also the society and, and different uh, values and, and so on. And particularly also, Lynette, uh, emphasizing on this importance of the representation. It's a real complex word. It's not straightforward a really good food for thought that we had. As we now move on to hear from three distinguished speakers, particularly be speaking about the data. I'm very happy to now, if you can go next slide, please. I'm very happy to introduce three uh, speakers who will be today uh, um, um, presenting three different data sets. First, uh, Yelzabeta Demidenko, 
knowledge management system from the Global Water Partnership. Second will be Maya Abertu, Senior Technical Advisor from UNEP DHI Center on Water Environment. And the third speaker will be the Melissa McCracken, Assistant Professor of International Environmental Policy at Tufts University. Next, please. So Elisabetta Demidenko, known as Lisa, she's our a colleague, she's my colleague, has been always behind the scene of all of the MOOC events, as you may have noticed. She is the knowledge management assistant at the Global Water Partnership and currently working here in Stockholm. Um, um, and been actually been the one key driving forces to develop this uh, um, toolbox that she'll be presenting today. She also has experience to work with OSCE as a special monitoring mission to Ukraine, uh, also being part of the UNEC Water Convention team in Geneva. So Lisa's fun fact is that she has been on safari with a family of friendly zebras and curious bisons. So maybe she has some very close encounterment to those animals. And the biggest achievement of life is Lisa hopes that her future achievement will help to lower the number of conflicts over resources around the world. Very, very important. Next slide, please. We are really pleased to also have um, Maya Bertu, who is a senior technical advisor of UNEP DHI Center, who is actually a very important partner to the GWP's work, particularly on our work on SDG. Maya is an environmental planner with more than 10 years of experience with international development projects in water and environment. Her areas of expertise include integrated water resource management and nature-based solutions to climate change adaptation. She's especially passionate about developing and implementing better ways of projects and work with nature as a central element for sustainable development. Maya's fun fact is that some of Maya's favorite uh, pastimes are surfing and mushroom hunting. Actually, that's a very important skill, I must say, living in here in the, in the Nordic country. The mushroom hunting is very important. And also to know where the mushroom exists is also important. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. We have another distinguished third speaker who is Melissa McCran. Mac she is an assistant professor of international environmental policy at Fletcher School, Tufts University. She is currently directing the Shared Waters Lab and is an affiliate with also the Center for International Environmental Resource Policy and Center for International Law of Governance at Fletcher School. The current work addresses how transboundary water cooperation is defined are measured with a good operationalization of method for evaluating effective transboundary water cooperation. She's also a collaborator with this transboundary freshwater diplomacy database at Oregon State University that she will be presenting today. So Melissa's fun fact that she has a bungee jump into the Nile. Wow, that's impressive. Actually, I would love to know exactly which point in the Nile that one can do this. Um, I have just been to the source of the Nile, but it must be somewhere downstream. The biggest achievement in her life is still in progress, but to see the great rivers of the world. What a nice uh, um, um, dream that you have as someone working on these topics. So thank you very much. Without further ado, we would like to now start from the first speaker, who is uh, Elisabetta Demidenko from the Global Water Partnership. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here with you and um, very excited to present our uh, leading knowledge platform in GWP, which is the uh, GWP Toolbox at the Worm Action Hub. So what you're seeing right now is the platform itself. And we, we thought that it's better to show you the platform and how it works than uh, kind of theoretical uh, background for this. So we invite you to go online and explore. But let me give you a bit of background and especially show you how you can use this platform in your uh, negotiations, stakeholder engagement, and especially for transboundary water management. 
So the GDLP toolbox is a knowledge platform that shows how to um, act on IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, and also shows practical examples of how it happened before. Um, the platform is structured in the following way. Uh, there are three main sections. There is Learn, uh, Explore, and Connect. And in the Learn section, you will be able to find IWRM approaches or different tools that will help you to, uh, to, to act on improving the either national or basin or transboundary water management. Uh, you will also see different resources that uh, back up those tools from the academic perspective. And you will see the learning opportunities for you to, to learn more about how, how those tools work. In the Explore section, you will find that the key studies, so the, the practical uh, implementation of those tools and what worked and what didn't from all around the world. Uh, and um, as a supplementary material, we also have country profiles. So you can see how each country is doing on uh, implementing the, the IWRM. And finally, the interactive part, the connect, is really where we put all of our communities of water professionals that come together and, um, and are passionate on, on working together towards a water secure world. So they want to exchange the solutions, they want to exchange the experiences, and they want to stay connected for future collaboration. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, we will start with the IWRM tool section uh, to learn more how this platform can be used uh, in negotiations and for transboundary water management. Um, so our tools are organized according to the four IWRM pillars. It's enabling environment, institutions and participation, management instruments and, and financing. And this is the new pillar that um, we found in the, in the recent relaunch of the platform this year, uh, we found that the financing instruments are really um, gaining more and more popularity in the, in, in the water sector. So we, we put a lot of those on the platform as well. And there is even one on transboundary uh, financing. Uh, but let's have a look how the tools are organized. So you will find subsections on particular topics that interest you. So for example, we have the transband related ones, the international water law, um, the rights of rivers and uh, basin management plans. And then if we go into the assessment instruments, uh, we're gonna be able to find such transband related tools as transboundary diagnostic analysis, and the source to see management. But what we're gonna be looking at today is really the tools that you could use for dialogue. And in our toolbox, we have a number of those. Um, I, we, I, I encourage you to, to go on the platform and have a look at the particular negotiation, uh, facilitation, mediation, conflict management, and water diplomacy. So the section should be really useful for you. Uh, but we will really focus on negotiation conflict management today. So let's see how a tool looks. So for example, when we land on the uh, negotiation tool page, we will see a short summary that um, presents um, a kind of like a brief explanation of what this tool is, how this approach works. And then when you scroll down, you're going to be able to see uh, the definition of very, various strategies that are used in uh, negotiation, then uh, the criteria that have been designed by, by academicians and practitioners for successful negotiations. Uh, then, for example, uh, what are the steps uh, necessary to be prepared for the interest-based negotiations and what is the difference between position and interest-based negotiations is really addressing the, the question from, um, from different sides. And then if you're interested to see other approaches, you can kind of hop back and forth uh, between these tools. Um, but all of the approaches that we have on, on, on the toolbox, all of the tools are interconnected with practical examples. Uh, so let's say you're interested to see how the approach works in practice, you will see the, the related case studies, so the, the instances where this tool has been used on the right pane. Uh, and let's go and have a look at the South African case study, for example. Uh, so here on the case study page, we will see also kind of a brief summary. Then you're going to be able to see the background. And here, this is a really interesting example of how to use um, simulation models and role-playing games and multi-stakeholder negotiations. So here you can see kind of a real-life example of the community of researchers, which was called companion uh, modeling, using participatory management for the natural resources. And they developed this um, uh, role-playing 
kind of game um, in, in South Africa in the Cat River Valley. And they were using it for stakeholder negotiations in order to, uh, to figure out the solution that would work for um, all of the stakeholders. So basically on the case study page, you're gonna be able to see which actions were taken, what were the outcomes, and then finally, what were the lessons learned? So you're going to be able to kind of like in a very concise way to uh, to learn about the practical application of that tool. And then you can go to supporting materials to see, to see more about this case study. On the right pane, as usual, as all of the tools and case studies are interlinked, uh, you can be able to hop back and forth between the tools, the approaches that were used in this instance. You're going to be able to know kind of like from, from different angles how to approach uh, the, the issue of negotiation in that particular case. Um, another handy tool, uh, if we go back uh, to the key study, so I'm now hopping back to the key study homepage. Um, so when we land on the key study um, homepage, if we, for example, wanna know more about how a particular tool was used in, in different uh, countries, and there is a handy filter on the key study section, which allows you to filter by tool. So for example, in this instance, I'm filtering by conflict management tool, and it gives me a number of results. Uh, and for example, let's say we want to compare the example from Bolivia, Cameroon, and Ethiopia. So it's a bit similar to how you would shop online. You kind of add items to the cart. And then you want to see the, how their characteristic, uh, characteristics compare. Um, so we have these buttons uh, called compare on the main page. And those will add the key studies to the comparison list. Um, so when arriving on the comparison, uh, comparison view, you will be able to see side by side the South African, the, the Romanian, the Armenian key study in this case, in this instance. And then you will see the summary, short summaries of what happened in there. Then what were the tools used? So for example, here we see negotiation, transboundary organizations, risk assessment. And then you will see side by side, very kind of like in a bullet point style, the lessons learned. Um, so this format allows you, for example, to explore, um, sorry, to export the comparison into the PDF, to use it as a print material, to use it to support your, um, your negotiations, your position, or for example, if you want to submit something like a project proposal, you can highlight the, the, the issue that is similar to several countries in this way through the comparison. Uh, another tool that we have on the, on the toolbox is the uh, country profiles. So here we're using the, the data uh, from the SDG indicator 651 that I'm sure Maya will tell you about uh, in more detail later. Um, so we have a large program um, on SDG 6 support and GWP. So this was a successful uh, example of collaboration with uh, UNEP DHI uh, pulling data from their data portal, which gives us an overview of how each country is doing on IWM implementation in the world. So for example, imagine that we want to know more uh, about South Africa. Uh, we will click on, on South Africa, zoom in on their profile, and then that will give me um, a short summary of what is their result? So the data had, that has been officially submitted by the country um, according to uh, the SDG 651 questionnaire, their score, and also kind of like more detailed, how are they doing on each of the components? And if you scroll just a little bit lower, just further down the, the page, you will see all of the resources and case studies that we have per country. So it gives you a good overview of what is what is happening in, in the country. And same can be done for any of the countries that, that report on, on this indicator. So it gives you an additional tool in your negotiations. Yeah, if you can wrap up, Lisa, please. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, just a, maybe a final thing, go on, online and test yourself on the uh, SDG 651 and how you understand uh, your country performs on IWRM. Uh, so this is a very interesting interactive one that we have online. And finally, the community part. Um, so something that we have recently launched in GWP, especially with the Transboundary team on the platform, since we have these groups that are uh, discussing a particular topic, uh, is our Transboundary Water Knowledge Exchange Hub. And this is exactly where our post-event discussion will be happening. Uh, you will see that there is a lot of interaction happening in the group. Uh, we advise you to um, we invite you to, to explore the group. You can you, you just need to click join and register on the platform to be a part of it. 
Um, this is our post-event discussion. Uh, this is where we're going to be able to connect with the speakers that you've listened to today and ask many, uh, many more questions that is possible within one and a half hours. Um, so please, we're looking forward to see you online, and I'm sure you will see the link in the chat. And if you want to know more about the platform, please come to the breakout. Thank you so much. Let me come back to you. Thank you very much, Lisa, of that tour of the GWP toolbox. Now I would like to invite Maya uh, to tell us about the TWAP and the database. Great. Thank you so much, Yumiko, and, and great to be here with all the participants. Um, as mentioned, I am part of the UNEP DHI team. And if we go to the next slide, please, um, just to, to mention that um, UNEP DHI um, is a collaboration center between UN Environment Program and DHI. And DHI specializes a lot in water resources modeling, um, environmental assessments, and uh, different types of uh, technical work. So this is just a few words about the background. And if we move to the next slide, please, um, I'll briefly introduce the Transboundary Waters Assessment Program, or TWAP. As you mentioned before, um, TWAP was a global assessment that took place now a few years ago already. Um, but it covered uh, all water systems. And as far as I know, it's still one of the most comprehensive global assessments of all transboundary waters to date. It was a, a GEF for Global Environment Facility funded global assessment of transboundary waters and the TWAP, TWAP river basins component that we were involved with and I will speak to was undertaken by a broad range of institutions. You have the logos here at the bottom of the slide. And of course, OSU were very important partners of that work. Um, TWAP assessment, because of its nature and focus on global assessment was based at the time on existing data sets and models and model tools. So that was sort of the framework within which it was established. And just on the right side here, you can see the overview of the transboundary basins that were assessed by TWAP. And I mentioned number 286 um, with a caveat that some of the very, very small basins were excluded due to some modeling uncertainties. In the little pop-up zoom in window there on the lower right side, you also see something called Basin Country Unit or BCU, which is essentially the portion of the basin belonging to the different countries. So BCUs within basin has a bit more detail of the assessment. And if we move to the next slide, um, uh, I'll tell more about that. So as a global assessment of transboundary river basins, um, it was looking at uh, five different thematic groups of indicators. So a very limited number of indicators, 15 indicators looking at the baseline, which at the time was 2010, and also a few additional indicators then linking to some of these other water systems within the broader TWAP assessment program. Um, for a selected number of indicators, TWAP also looked at projected stresses. So for years 2030 and 2050 at the time. Um, one thing I want to mention in terms of uh, TWAP assessment results and indicator results, if you were to go and look at the TWAP data portal, is that the focus of TWAP river basins assessment was really identifying relative risk. And it has to do with the fact that initially the assessment was designed to assist Jeff and other uh, global organizations in prioritizing their work within the different transboundary basins. So when you look at the risk uh, in the indicator values, which is looking at very low to very high risk, it is the relative risk. So looking at how is that specific basin uh, within the specific issue relating to the other transboundary basins globally. And this is the same for the BCUs. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, you can see a, a few snapshots here from the main reports, and of course, all indicator results are still available online and the reports as well. You see how um, the approach of using the BCU level assessment gives a much more detail to understanding what are the dynamics within the basins and especially where the different stressors uh, might originate. And this is also to help understand you know, maybe where there's more need for proactive approach to the various issues. And within the assessment, 
we looked at 286 transboundary basins, but the number of BCUs that we assessed was close to 800. So a lot more detail in the results for the different stressors. And we assessed um, basin and BCU level results for all the indicators covered by the assessment. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned, all the results are available on the Twap River Basin's data portal. This includes the indicator results at basin, basin country unit level. You can see little buttons there at the top of the page. Um, also, for each of the basins assessed, um, a basin fact sheet is available, which summarizes the results. Um, and of course, uh, possibility to, to explore not only the indicator results, but also to create um, indices that would be relevant for, for the users. And if we go to the last slide, please, um, just as, as mentioned, um, we work extensively with GWP and other partners on SDG related data. So just two resources I wanted to mention here in closure is the IWM data portal where um, uh, data just mentioned uh, originate from. It is national level data that countries report to UN on their progress of implementation on integrated water resources management, but they do have also questions relating to transboundary issues specifically. So there is also a transboundary um, data element there. And of course, the Freshwater Ecosystems Explorer as well that looks at the ecosystem um, change over time. So this is the Sustainable Development Goal Indicator 661, looking at the change in ecosystems. Again, data available on national level, but also on basin, sub-basin level. So the links are here. I'm sure presentations will be shared. And of course, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions about SWAP or any of these two resources as we go to the breakout groups. Um, I think my time is up for the presentation, but thank you. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion um, here in the breakout group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. A great introduction to this uh, TWAP, and I'm sure a lot of people have more questions to go to your breakout. Um, so the, the final speaker here today to introduce the, another data set is Melissa. Uh, who will be talking about this uh, uh, transboundary uh, diplomacy, sorry, freshwater diplomacy database. So Melissa, floor is yours. Thank you, Yumiko. Um, pleasure to be here this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. I'm going to be talking about the transboundary freshwater diplomacy database. Many of you might be familiar with it. Actually, quite a few of you were familiar with it from the poll earlier, uh, but we did just recently change the name to the diplomacy database instead of the dispute database. After some conversations with several of our partners uh, with GWP South Africa and some of the, the countries that we're working with in the, the region, uh, we realized that Diplomacy Database actually better captures a lot of the work that we do. Um, so I'll give you an overview of the database here today. Uh, next slide, please. So the database uh, has a lot on it, and I'm going to be talking about just four specific database uh, data sets that are contained within TFDD. Uh, but just to give you a, an overview of everything else that's available online, there's a collection of various case studies looking at uh, negotiations that have happened over transboundary waters. We have a, a large collection of primary documents from negotiations that have happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so those are all like source original documents that are scanned and uploaded and are available for you. And plus there's a whole host of resources looking at data, publications, journal articles that have been collected and created over the years by the various scholars that are associated with the database. But what I want to focus on today is the four data sets. So next slide, please. The primary data set that serves as the foundation for pretty much all the work that we do within the TFDD is the spatial database. So we actually just updated the, the database earlier this year. So there are 312 transboundary river basins now. We just added two additional ones um, following the conclusion of the ICJ case, um, the Salala. We added the lower river basin and a small basin that we had, we had missed um, it was very small in area due to some uh, resolution differences in West Africa. 
So as um, Maya introduced, we look at the basin country units. And so we're able to then match the political and social data that we collect in the other data sets to this underlying spatial data set. So we're able to look at trends um, spatially within the various other data sets. You can look at population density, number of dams, and various other more statistical style of information um, for each basin. The second data set on the next slide is the International Freshwater Treaties Database. And so this data set is in the process of being updated. We've been working on this for several years. It's been a, a large process, but we're up to slightly over 800 uh, basin, or sorry, 800 treaties and agreements within the data set. Uh, so we've added over 200 agreements thus far. This data set essentially captures a very large sample of the agreements treaties, conventions, MOUs signed between states over their transboundary waters, whether it's surface waters or groundwaters, both are included. As you can see at the map here, it's just showing the circles are the number of agreements that are signed by each, each country, and it draws lines to connect to which, base, which other states those states have signed agreements with. We look at a whole host of different codes that we um, read through each agreement for, around 130. We look at whether there's a conflict resolution mechanism, if there's allocation mechanisms, how do they deal with groundwater, and a whole host of other topics, and then provide the location of where that treaty discusses it. So it's a nice place to start. If you're looking for examples of a particular mechanism, you could go search the database, and find a sample of treaties and then access the full PDF text of those documents. The third database on the next slide is the International Events Database. And so this is really the found, one of our founding data sets where we look at tracking the level of conflict and cooperation that has happened between states over their transboundary waters. So we collect news article events and we code them from a scale of plus seven to minus seven to see the degree of conflict or cooperation that has happened in that particular event. This is historical. So we look from the or late 1940s and all the way up through 2022, actually. And we're in the process of collecting new data to update this data set right now. This is also a tabular data set. So you can access the Excel file that looks at all of the events that we've calculated or that we've collected. And we code for upstream downstream relationships, as well as several other components in addition to that plus seven to minus seven degree of conflict and cooperation. The last data set I wanna introduce here is the River Basin Organizations on the next slide, thank you. And this is uh, was started by Dr. Susanna Schmeyer. For those of you that um, were at the last session, she introduced um, talking about river-based organizations in particular. And so we are happy to host this data set and collaborate with her on an ongoing update of this as well. So again, we're looking at over 120 plus river basin organizations in 110 different basins. And we look at each of these basins in particular, diving into some of the founding documents, such as the treaties, uh, their procedural mechanisms, how are these organizations established, of what is their institutional design, and we have a tabular data set that you can download and actually sort through and filter what type of um, funding mechanisms do RBOs have, for example. So there's a lot of information available, and hopefully we'll have a chance in the Knowledge Hub to answer more questions about the types of data, but I encourage you to explore the TFDD website on your own to poke through and see what we have available for you. And with that, um, the next slide, just to kind of overview some of the values that this uh, process looks at. We can take all of these different data sets because they're so spatially linked with that spatial data set. We can look at all these different trends. So where do we see uh, conflict resolution mechanisms, for example? Where do we see river basin organizations that have a specific type of funding mechanism? So we can look at trends spatially, and it also allows us to look at historical trends, um, specifically looking at the events data, for example, that started in the 1940s. This allows us to combine and ask typical, uh, different types of questions. So what is the level of institutional capacity in these places? Can we potentially predict conflict because we have this data available to us? 
Plus, I think from a user standpoint, it gives you a curated collection of data so you can start to sift through the vast amounts and look for specifically what you need and then find the underlying raw data, such as the text of the treaties that are most useful for you and your particular needs. We do have to realize that this is a global data set, so there are some limitations. Often, we're just looking at the global scale in this data set. But as we know, uh, hydropolitical conflicts and cooperation can happen at different scales. So there are gonna be some scalar disconnects that might all be overlooked. Plus, it's, we're just focusing on state actors, so it's hard to capture the influence and the role that non-state actors might play in these processes if you just look at the data that's included in the TFDD. Furthermore, um, the challenge of dealing with on paper versus in practice. At this scale, it's very hard to be able to assess the degree of implementation or the degree of quality of many of these mechanisms. And so that's something to take into account when utilizing data such as what's contained within the TFDD. So with that, um, thank you all. And I look forward to answering more of your questions in the interactive session. Thank you very much, Melissa. It was a big challenge to introduce these very complex data sets in just five minutes. But I think for well, three speakers, really, we saw a range of different kinds of data uh, from from governance to biophysical to also some case studies and and also some has more interactive features and so on. So they are all complementing each other. So thank you so much for that. Now I would like to introduce two um, our distinguished moderators. Next slide, please. Of this final discussion now uh, is Alexandra Kaplan. She is a doctoral candidate at Oregon State University. And also she's the manager of this transboundary freshwater diplomacy database that Melissa has just introduced. Her research takes a multi-sector approach to the study of power and politics in international river basins with a regional focus on the Middle East. So Alexandra's fun fact is that she is an avid runner and competed in college. So yes, she must be very fit here. And her biggest achievement so far is moving to Oregon to study water. That's a really great place to study. I can assure that. Next slide, please. So the, another moderator, I'm very happy to introduce Zoe Rosenblum. She's a PhD student in geography at the Oregon State University. Her research explores the governance of transboundary wetlands. She's also completed her master's degrees at this water corporation, joint masters of Oregon and IHE. And she's experienced in wet and policy from working at the US Environmental Protection Agency and, and, and so on. And I'm also happy to say that as Zoe, really, I must say it was this today's event was a big team effort, but Zoe was really the one that brought us all together. So thank you so much for Zoe uh, for really uh, taking the lead in preparation of today's event. So now with this, I would like to hand over to two of you for the panel discussion. All right, thanks Yumiko and thanks to our panelists for sharing today. A really great event and lots of great information coming out. Um, looking at our Mentimeter, I wanted to start off with a question for um, each of our panelists to respond to. There's a question on how can we combine both physical and socioeconomic data in a fruitful way to make better decisions in transboundary water governance? So I think this one kind of reflects on especially the presentation from Lynette about these different um, levels of governance and especially the social factors to consider. Um, so if each of our panelists could respond, let's go ahead and start with Lisa. Absolutely. Um, so one of the practical examples that we've seen how, how the data can be used in, in negotiations uh, was actually recently during the, the Pan-African uh, training that we had on international water law, where we were using some of the some of the tools that you will see managed on the other way on toolbox. Um, so we could see a, a very, uh, in, in, in kind of great detail, how the process was going in several countries that were discussing, for example, the accession to the uh, UNICE Water Convention, and they could see how, how around the table they were sharing very practical examples of which approaches worked in a particular case, 
and which didn't. And then uh, we could see that some of those case studies that actually are online on the platform uh, are exactly kind of depicting the, um, uh, the steps uh, taken in each of those uh, negotiations, kind of like round tables. Uh, so it was really interesting to see how uh, the theoretical presentations were taken uh, in practice, kind of like in the discussion. And really those uh, kind of like firsthand experience was something that prompted the people to feel maybe a little bit closer during the discussion and share personal experiences. And especially it was interesting since uh, during the training we had had participants uh, coming from different backgrounds. Some of them are coming from the civil society. Some of them are coming from the government. And then... Um, Kind of like these common experiences and, and common challenges that they've had uh, was really the, the catalyzer for these meaningful uh, discussions to happen. So what we could see is that there is really a great, um, great impact of popularizing these experiences, of sharing them online, of showcasing them, because if that brings the stakeholders closer to, to find a common solution when they see that someone had a similar problem and they managed to overcome it, uh, then I think that's, uh, uh, that is a really great, great example. Thank you, Lisa. And um, Maya, the TWAP data set is a lot of physical data. Can you reflect on how it might be combined with some socioeconomic uh, data mm. for making better decisions? Sure. Thank you for the for the question. It's, it's of course really relevant. Um, I think one of the purposes of the of the global assessment with the TWAP was also to try combine a very limited amount of indicators that would cover all dimensions, which include both environmental and socioeconomic, uh, and also governance. And of course, it was a, a painful and long discussion in choosing the indicators, but I think looking at the risk categories for the basins, it really showed how those elements do very directly affect each other. And in terms of the environmental risks, and also if we're looking at scenarios for climate change and how those are going to affect water resources availability, um, I think you also see that socioeconomic factors can be very important drivers on whether those risks are going to exacerbate or not. So looking at combination of um, information and data, for example, on what climate change will mean for purely water resources availability combined with, you know, what are the population growth dynamics, what are the economic growth dynamics in the same areas says a lot about what decisions need to be made. Um, in terms of, um, you know, examples from TWAP, for example, one of the indicators under social economics looked at um, developments within um, uh, hydropower in, um, infrastructure within basins. And looking at, you know, what is water resources availability going to look like in basins when such develop, where such developments are planned in combination of looking, are there actually governance management arrangements in place to manage, you know, shocks or manage the developments in the infrastructure is really important, um, not only in negotiations, but I think also in preemptive um, action for making sure that, you know, if changes happen, you know, if, if there is, um, of course, population growth or reduced water availability, that this is something that has arrangements in place, you know, before a potential conflict already occurs. So I think um, looking at those factors together as they are today, but also trying to see, you know, what are developments going forward is really important and can point to need for for putting governance uh, arrangements in place. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Yeah, so definitely important. Melissa, would you like to add anything on um, these synergies between socioeconomic and physical data? Yeah, I think from uh, the TFTD perspective, something that we've looked at is with allocations, um, where we see a great intersection of physical data and social data. So we've been recently working on a component of the treaties database where we've updated the typology for how we measure and track, uh, sorry, not how we measure, but how we track allocation mechanisms within agreements. And I think within the allocations component, we can see an evolution of how treaties originally were just focused on the physical component and were quantifying the allocations that they made. We've seen shifts now that um, states are starting to incorporate more specific uses and looking at creating uh, more indirect mechanisms for allocating water 
to incorporate some of this social and economic components. So it's both sides of the decision we need to make with respect to allocations. How much water do we have? What are the uses of water? How are they being used? And finding the appropriate allocations that fit both sets of data. Hi, thanks Melissa. And we'd like to take time to have just one more question uh, posed to the panelists from Alex. Great, thank you, Zoe. And thank you to our three panelists who provided very excellent overview of some really important data sets. Um, but I think one thing that's important to discuss when we are, you know, talking about data and, you know, what types of data should be included in negotiations is whose voices are informing the creation of these data sets and who's deciding what's getting put into these data sets. And so a question that was posted on uh, the Mentimeter is whose voices inform the creation of the data set and who decides what information is important to include or to not include. So if each of the panelists could maybe just devote uh, one minute recognizing that we um, are a little behind on time to answering this question, I think that would be a great way to wrap up the discussion. Uh, Lisa, do you want to go first? Absolutely. Uh, so actually our platform is a collaborative effort exactly mentioning all of those voices, giving them the, the platform. So in our uh, organization, we have this GWP network that works both on regions and country levels. So what we've done when we redesigned the platform this year, we had this kind of personas or we imagine who might be using our platform. And so we had this kind of like a typical person from the government official, typical person from civil society, academia, and also our own network how they would be using the platform, which tools they would need, what kind of instances they would apply to and what kind of case studies they would be looking for. And so then after we've created these uh, kind of ima like imaginary personas, we actually find found real people that would embody these uh, kind of patterns and, and behaviors. And we had larger focus groups to precisely discuss with them, what is that you're looking for? How would you be looking for information in your uh, in your daily job, and for example, if you learn, if, if you're looking to learn something, uh, something more, would you be going to a library? Would you be going to to Facebook or any other kind of like professional network that you have? So this is really the thinking that we've put into the platform, and I'm I'm hoping that you know when you're moving through the platform, you will see this kind of logic in there. So it's really designed to kind of close the learning loop. So you learn something, then you explore how it works, and then you connect to discuss more. Great, thank you, Lisa and Maya. Would you like to yes. go next? Thanks so much. Yeah, so for of course, I should mention that the TWAP assessment was fit for purpose in a way that it was made to assess all basins on a global scale. So of course, it does have some limitations in terms of both the data availability and coarsity. But I think what we have seen, what has been useful to stakeholders in basins, has been not so much the, maybe the exact replication of the indicator framework but actually the structure so looking at uh, covering the socioeconomic aspects covering the governance aspects covering also the climate change sort of looking forward scenario so i can give example of just recent discussions we've had with gf colleagues and representatives from amazon basin in their efforts to or preparation for for repeat of their diagnostic analysis at the basin level and also preparation of the action program for the basin is that they've found the structure of the assessment useful but of course the actual indicators that would then represent um, socioeconomics or environmental issues are tailored for the basin and for what is relevant in the region and of course looking at much more specific data coming from the basin countries that can be then harmonized for the use so I think it has to be also acknowledged that global level assessments cannot necessarily be taken and fully replicated for the basins, but there is a lot that can be reused in the structure and, of course, um, hopefully serve as inspiration also for how to have a relatively um, small indicated data set that's still meaningful and is actually useful for making decisions on changing decisions on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Maya and Melissa. Um, yeah, so I think this is a really interesting question, uh, especially from a, the perspective of a very academically based uh, data set like the TFDD. So much of the creation of our data set has been driven by academic research, but I also think a really unique piece about the TFDD is a lot of it is organic um, in who we work with and the partners that we have, and often we're adding components to the data set that are really tailored to the specific users 
and uh, based on our project partners that we might have. So, um, for example, we were working with um, a group that was interested in conflict resolution mechanisms in particular. So we're actually able to recreate some conflict resolution codes that better fit their needs and what we originally had in the data set. And we were able to provide that information to them. So we're happy to work with basin partners um, as well as other organizations to kind of tailor the data set to specific needs. Thanks. And um, there were many other great questions put in the Mentimeter. So I encourage you to turn to those for our next um, breakout rooms, which Yumiko will tell us about. Thank you very much, Zoe and Alex, uh, for a great uh, moderation. Now is the time for you to speak more directly with the speakers. Mm -hmm. So next, in the next 15 minutes, you have opportunity to choose your breakout room if you want to hear more about the GWDP toolbox, go to the room one. If you want to know more about the TWAP, uh, go to room two. And if you want to know more about this TFDD database, uh, please go to th number three. Our technical host will be opening now the breakout room. So you can simply just click which one you want to go. And if you don't know how to, how to join, then simply type in the chat which room you want to join and our technical host will help you to bring you directly so we'll come back at 25 minutes past the hour i hope you enjoy the breakout Hello, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you really enjoyed this breakout session. It was, at least in my group, was very lively. And I'm sorry the last uh, person who was trying to ask the, ask the question was cut off in the middle of the questions. But um, please, we do have this post-event discussion. So any uh, anything more you want to discuss, please go to that hub that we will show you in a minute. But I per perhaps uh, um, on behalf of all the speakers and the chairs, I would like to invite uh, Professor Aaron Wolf to just to uh, give uh, to wrap up today's discussion and to give a final remark. So Aaron, please. Thanks so much, uh, Yumiko, and thanks so much to the uh, to the panelists for um, uh, for giving us such a such a thorough overview of what's going on in the in the data world and i think in in terms of of negotiations this is a, a game changer i think so, uh, it, with in my early part of the career people could use a lack of data to postpone or to avoid negotiations and i think that's not true any longer uh, precisely because of the of the deep efforts of of a lot of the people who were involved today um so i'm very grateful to the panelists for sharing their expertise and just to know this is only a sample uh, there are other um uh, databases uh, that focus on transboundary waters. Of course, IW Learn has has massive amounts of information and an interactive platform. Uh, IUCN has a water law and governance uh, database where they're um, also compiling uh, treaties and and uh, examples of governance. Uh, the World Resources Institute has a an accessible database. So I think as we're able to to unify. Um, our information. Uh, and I think this ethic of making data accessible to as many people as possible uh, is something that really is helping helping to promote better dialogue um, around the world. And, and so just noticing from where people are joining us today, uh, the fact that we're able to have this conversation across the world in real time uh, is an example of, of how we're using technology to further uh, dialogue and conversation. So again, I'm, I'm very grateful to the panelists. I'm grateful to all the participants. And as ever, it's a joy to be working with, uh, with GWP. And we look forward to many more uh, terrific conversations in the future. Thanks again, Yumiko. Thank you very much, Aaron, for that final word. And I would also like to echo uh, Aaron for really thanking all the panelists, the speakers, and also the moderators for really uh, making this event happen. So thank you so much. 
And the next slide, please. Um, I would really like to encourage everyone to now come to this post-event discussion uh, thread. Please join this Transboundary Water Knowledge Exchange Hub. Go to this discussion forum. You can ask any other remaining questions. Uh, you can, if you join this uh, hub, you can also send like a private messages to people. So if you want to be in touch with certain speakers or any people that you saw in today's event, or you can just also find a lot of people who are in, in, this, uh, in this hub that are already members, that are very interesting profiles. Please uh, communicate, utilize this opportunity. Uh, this, this, uh, we, we developed this hub based on the requests from all of you who came to the MOOC and also to our events. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. I would like to finally also remind you that the MOOC is always open. Uh, current phase is running until the end of uh, August uh, next year. Please sign up to the MOOC. We are all, always happy to see all of you to join us. And please also come to our, we are moving our discussion forum of the MOOC into this Transboundary Water Knowledge Hub. And uh, today is the last event of this year, but we will be coming back to all of you with the new events for the new year. And uh, we are also very happy to say that Oregon State University has already committed to have another event following today's event. So please stay tuned. We really look forward to seeing all of you again. So thank you very much. And before we close, uh, traditional our tradition is that we take a group photo. We invite everyone to open your camera and give a big smile and so we can all see each other. And uh, yes, we can keep this as a nice memory. And please note that we might be using this photo for our promotional purposes. So yes, please give a big, a big smile and please switch on your camera. Yes, nice to see so many familiar faces. Maybe we can just wave to each other and then the technical host to tell us when you're done with taking the photos. Thanks. Okay, great. So with that, thank you very much for joining today. And I'm really wishing you a very happy day and, uh, and the evenings. Thank you so much for joining and see you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>